Ready? Sir. Very good. <laughs> Welcome, David. <laughs> All right, the Policy Review Committee will now come to order. Directing our attention to our uh, first item, which is uh, approval of the minutes. Uh, those minutes may be viewed at HTTPS uh, colon double backslash uh, vimeo.com slash 2698627241. Uh, moving on to unfinished business. Uh, policy 8222, Superintendent, Executive Officer, Secretary, and Treasurer. Um, the short version on this is that uh, when this matter was before the board, the uh, comment was made, and I, I also uh, made comment, that as drafted, it did not fully comply with our editing conventions. Uh, we had some hanging titles, and staff went back and adjusted that. And now, um, since that time, uh, the General Assembly has passed legislation, legislation which um, expands somewhat on what records the board is to keep during its meeting. And um, while it may not be an extensive expansion, uh, the statute reads as it reads. And my recommendation to uh, the uh, committee is that uh, the matter be returned to staff for it to now um, uh, again modify policy 8222 so that it reflects uh, what the General Assembly has uh, passed and which has been signed into law with regard to uh, certain specific um, um, matters or certain specific things to be kept with the records. Uh, we had also uh, asked that staff come and respond to some questions that were raised during our board meeting about certain language of the statute, such as, you know, full record and like that. And uh, with that, I will um, turn to our um, committee counsel and ask her to approach the table and address some of those questions, please. Good afternoon, members of the committee. I was asked a few questions concerning uh, board policy 8222 and how it related to House Bill 76, the Education Transparency Act. Specifically, um, I was asked about what the act meant with respect to a full and accurate description of an action. So um, in reading tea leaves, because that's pretty much what this requires, this analysis requires, uh, the act itself does not define full and accurate description. Uh, the act simply indicates that as a result of the new law that you, uh, the Board of Education, will now be required to include a full and accurate description of your final actions. There are other requirements in the statute. For example, you're now required required by law to keep a link or place a link in your minutes to um, all the actions of the local board. That you already do, um, and that your staff already does. So the, the new requirement has to do with the accurate description. <coughs> uh, Based on my reading of parliamentary procedure and what the board already does concerning its minutes, which are video minutes, I think that an accurate description of the final actions taken could be considered to be basically minutes, written minutes, of what the local board does. And Roberts indicates, um, it's Roberts Rules of Order, um, newly revised, it's the 11th edition, subsection 48, indicates that the minutes of an assembly include the actions that the particular assembly takes. This particular uh, board can then, as a result, and I've provided this to, um, to Mr. Virch, you need to write out your, um, your motions, the language of your motions, so that those can then be recorded by your administrative assistant and be given as a description, included as a description then, um, for uh, compliance with the statute. Association of Parliamentarians. And um, uh, 
uh, the form speaks for itself. But if um, I could ask members to direct their attention if I could ask our members to direct their attention to uh, policy 8222 uh, in their packets, and if members were to go to, say, page 2 and over to line 14, uh, line 14 on page 2 um, indicates that among the duties of the secretary, um, because the superintendent is a member of the board but doesn't vote, among the duties is to record minutes of the meetings of the board. And to the extent the General Assembly's action um, modifies a specific section of the education article, um, it would be very, uh, it'd be a very straightforward effort to revise this policy to reference the changes um, identified in the General Assembly's Act. Staff could then with those changes, come back to the committee with this revised language. The committee now has a cleaned up copy and can readily uh, review and make any additional changes, assuming staff might not yet have um, written it in the most efficient manner or to members' preferences. David. Um, doesn't the uh, video taping do exactly that without um, putting it in verbiage on paper? Uh, just one moment. Go ahead, Ms. Howie. Well, uh, you're, you are required by the Open Meetings Act to keep minutes. You are permitted by the Open Meetings Act to keep video minutes. It seems to me, my, the way I analyze it, it seems to me that if the video minutes were sufficient, there wouldn't be any need for the Education Transparency Act. So if you already had enough and were doing what you needed to do under the Open Meetings Act, I don't see why, why the General Assembly would have given you an additional requirement. Again, some of this is a little bit like reading tea leaves because the legislative history is non-existent. There is nothing in the legislative history that indicates why the General Assembly is requiring this, why the delegation required this, but clearly um, the Open Meetings Act was not considered to be sufficient. But when, when common sense tell us that not every um, committee board throughout the state videos uses video minutes, and I would think that the, the, the act would be um, in line with those who would require those who do not video. And then, in other words, the, the video to me seems to supersede virtually everything. But I'm sure most, most or many do not video the meeting, so I could see why someone would want a transparency act. I mean, it makes sense then. But short of, of that's the only reason I can think of, what better, uh, you know, uh, method could you use uh, than looking at a video and hearing words that are spoken that are acted upon. I'm, you know, I just think it, it's, it, for us, it just gives us additional work that doesn't seem to me to be uh, necessary, to be quite frank with you. Well, two things. First, the act um, doesn't uh, apply. Um, this particular act uh, doesn't reference any other boards of education. It only references ours. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah. And there's a copy in uh, in the packet. I read you it. Got I didn't realize. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't read. It. It's only one over again. And to the extent that uh, the um, uh, legislative history is wanting, um, it seems, without making it more than it is, that a reference in policy to uh, the specific. Um, section of the education article that the legislature chose to amend to reference Baltimore County really allows us to have it in a very nice, complete way. Mm -hmm. And so rather than have um, a policy that um, was in one shape before the General Assembly acted, um, in the event that there is something in addition, um, this certainly makes it clear what all is supposed to be available to folks. The last part of this is this. Um, however um, accurate or reflective of board action video minutes may be, remember 
in the use, all mediums have their advantages and their disadvantages, and video minutes can also be cumbersome in their use. So as opposed to going to a table of contents and finding a specific word and going to that page, while there is a link and a reference, and that's identified in the, um, in the act, there may also be an advantage to those um, folks who are attempting to use both the video minutes and uh, any accompanying record, written record, to help guide them in their search for whatever occurred as board action. Lastly, um, action itself is not defined because depending on how you look at it, not taking action may actually be action. Um, and it says action taken. So in an effort to accommodate the, the act, which is now law, it seems that a specific reference to that section gets us there and solves for whatever problem may, however ill-defined it may have been, it was sufficient for the legislators to feel something was warranted. Okay. Yes, okay. Kathleen. Thank you, Mr. Birch. In um, reading over the policy and the additional law, um, I looked up some other websites and there is a, and I agree with you, Mr. Virch, that uh, the video can be detailed, but it can also be cumbersome. And um, while we do have that and people can go and watch the whole meeting or segments of it tied to our minutes, or tied to board docs rather, it still can be very cumbersome. Um, one of the things that I saw that might be helpful is a simple table that's on a website and it has the brief motion and then a grid across the top, simple spreadsheet or table, and then it just goes down and tells what each board member's vote was on the brief description of the motion. Um, so that would seem to fulfill the requirement of the law, have something that's efficient, not too much work for staff to do, um, and this motion form could be helpful in terms of clarifying the exact motion and then allowing our staff to minimize it if need be or in its totality if it's brief enough as it stands. So I would suggest staff look at something along those lines. And also with our board docs where we have the agenda items um, to look into some manner that they may have in terms of just moving right along that board docs agenda with the votes. Um, I know when we went to National Association School Board Conference um, in, in Texas, the board docs folks there were telling me about all these new modules that they had, so maybe that's something we can look into and that would be helpful rather than have a separate table. But even the separate table could be considered, I wouldn't think it would be that much extra work. I'd be interested in others' thoughts. Any other comments? So, um, my suggestion is that this, this be returned to staff to reflect an amendment that references the specific changes to the educational article, and um, when, if, if in fact that's what the committee's wishes are, when staff returns, then staff can say, listen, we took a look at board docs, um, here's what else we suggest for how this information can be displayed. Yes, Kathleen. I agree with sending it back to staff. I would want to make um, a couple motions now for the PRC committee members to consider in before we send it back. Would this be an appropriate time for that? Um, is it on point to the um, Transparency Act? And um, members of the committee, the, um, the statute is effective as of July 1st. So what Ms. Decker and I do in terms of procedure will be doing for the board in order to comply with the act as of July 1st. So you will not have the policy again before July 1st, and the policy probably will not detail how staff will comply on behalf of the board, simply that staff will comply on behalf of the board.
So, Kathleen, um, um, any amendments? Uh, are, do they reference the uh, legislature's concern with regard to the Transparency Act? Some do, one does not. All right, well, let's have, the, let's have those that do, and we'll go through them, and if they're seconded, uh, we'll, uh, we'll go through them accordingly. Okay, um, on page two, line 23, which is labeled uh, B9, it says maintain accurate records, including a stenographic transcript of all board hearings. I would like to amend it to say made available on the website. I well, here's the issue in part there. There's, um, there's a confidentiality issue with regard to um, certain types of board hearings. So if there was like a hearing, like a public hearing, that's a little different matter than a hearing that related to an employment matter or um, one of our students uh, taking an appeal of a decision made elsewhere. And that's why we, of course, discuss these things in closed session in, you know, in accordance with, of course, the Open Meetings Act exceptions. Yes, and my reading was that paragraph eight maintain accurate records, including a stenographic transcript of all hearings involving disputes and controversies, reference those items that would remain confidential, and that the maintain accurate records, including a stenographic transcript of all board hearings, was those public board hearings. Mm -hmm. So whether we would put in the word public or put in where appropriate, so that board hearings that are not appropriate to be put on the website would not be, and that would be a decision of um, the board and the staff as to what was appropriate to put on the website. Well, I think um, the word public really sort of then clarifies it um, so that there's no issue of confidentiality. The second part to that is, of course, um, I've been a proponent for a long time on the board of, of having transcripts available, um, and we actually priced it out at about 30000 or so, maybe a little bit more. It's approximately $46,000 a year. And, and, and costs do increase over time. Um, and, you know, that's what the cost would be for that information to then be available for anyone to look at. Um, I actually think it's a good idea so that folks can use both the video and the transcription. Whether the transcription is stem stenographic with a person sitting at a um, device typing or whether it's simply the words that were recorded then being turned into um, print for folks to read, that can certainly be worked out um, uh, whatever the board's preference is. Um, David? Well, first of all, um, as to what you're saying, our hearings aren't videoed, so. Mm -hmm. Well, that could also change. Well, that, that's, okay, that could. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, go ahead. I don't know if it's realistic. But the difference between eight and nine is very simple. And in, in eight, it doesn't say board, all board hearings. In nine, it says all board hearings. One Correct. says all hearings, and one says all board hearings. Yeah. That's a distinction right there to me. Yeah, and it's almost as if um, when, when David says eight, he's actually referring to uh, that numbered uh, subsection that appears before, obviously, nine. All, all hearings would be almost a rubric for everything. And that's why Kathleen was suggesting that the insertion of the word public solves for why um, controversies and uh, in disputes and controversies. Or in the alternative, it could say all board hearings with the exception of those involving disputes and controversies. Because if you notice, the term all hearings appears up in the um, in eight as well. No instances when, when we have a hearing that doesn't fall into those uh, that area? I'm trying to think of one. Uh, I've had a request to, um, you know, for an easement or something. It's not a dispute, it's just a request. It depends on how it's structured. 
depends on the way in which the individual brings it forward to the board. Any other um, comments? All right, well, Kathleen, um, you, uh, we were gonna take these motions that you had one at a time, so if you have one, if you'd like to make your motion, and um, um, if it, to the extent it's involving public, then we'll, we'll do the word public. Yes, so I would make my motion for page two. It's line number 23, labeled number nine. Maintain accurate records, including a stenographic transcript of all public board hearings to be made available on the website. Yeah, David, I mean, is there a second? Well, I may, but let me ask the question. What about when we have a public hearing on budget? Well, first, I'll second the motion. Okay. Go ahead. What would we do in a situation where we have a public hearing on um, boundaries, public? Mm -hmm. you, you're gonna have that stenographic? You're gonna have someone there I'm just just curious how it's all going to work. First, forty-six thousand yeah. is going to get a little bit more. I'm afraid. Well, forty-six thousand well, I think, I think, was based yeah. on just board meetings. Board meetings, and that was two yeah. years ago. I just want to point out. Sure. The language now says all. It without a doubt, and I'll, I'll let the the movement uh, speak first. Go ahead, Kathleen. Thank you. So the microphones are working now too. Um, so I would just suggest that it would actually be efficient and effective both in time, in terms of getting communications out, but also in terms of budget, to have the transcripts done by a professional that's efficient and effective, and then it will take less time for the rest of our staff that have to use the information from those meetings to do the work of the system. That is correct. Um, so, uh, Chuck? Um, I would just like to say that uh, a move toward transparency is certainly the one we want to make. Um, and just my limited exposure, I'm not aware of boards typically uh, making stenographic recordings of everything, and I, I think maybe as a part of our review of this issue that we could kind of do a best practice. If the best practice is to do stenographic uh, recording of everything, I think that's what I would support. Um, it just doesn't seem to me at this point to be a common thing, and I just, um, I don't mind being cutting edge, but we could be jumping into some extreme cost, and maybe there's a more efficient way of still being transparent and not moving toward uh, a stenographic move um, in that direction. To the extent that the earlier estimate was generated on the basis of board meetings, then um, is it fair to say that that estimate would have looked at how long the, at that time, average board meeting length was? The average that we provided for um, the estimate was five hours. Mm -hmm. So um, the cost jumps when Number one, an individual has to be present at a board meeting as opposed to uh, simply listening to a video or listening to, looking at a video or listening to an audio recording. And then the cost is also impacted by when you wish to have the transcript. Um, normally what happens in litigation uh, is that you're provided a draft transcript because oftentimes uh, spellings are incorrect, things are inaudible, so it's not uncommon that while there is or could be a quick turnaround, there may need to be um, corrections made as well. Yeah, David. Uh, let me ask you this question, Morgan. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been in, in hearings or in courtrooms. When there's a disturbance, 
and, and I'm thinking in terms of we have a public hearing, and there's always a lot going on. And we have people talking over people and the background and everything else. What does the stenographer... David, you got your microphone on there, buddy. Mm -hmm. Thanks. What does the stenographer actually record? If, if Part of it you may not even hear. I mean, we've been through that situation where we're using loudspeakers, people are talking. Um, you know, it seems to me, I'm trying to see what's the value of this. I, I'm, I, I can't pin myself on anything of value, um, but I think there's going to be a dramatic cost, number one. And number two, um, I, I think we're going to run into situations that doesn't even make any common sense. Um, we got we got many times people talking over people, and I, I don't know how a stenographer. I'm mean, you know, I don't know how well, to handle all that. Again, uh, the, my point of reference would be hearings, and in hearings, uh, usually the hearing examiner or the judge will say the court reporter can only record one person at a time. So could you please not speak over the court, not speak over each other, rather, so that the court reporter can record one person. If there's someone um, who is making comments that um, may not be directly in a microphone, it may be um, from the gallery, then usually it's an inaudible is placed in uh, the transcript. Um, but again, that's, that's usually the discretion of the hearing examiner, the court reporter, when you see the final product. Any other comments? Ms. Halley, um, this draft of policy 8222 came from staff, is that correct? That is correct. And as number nine, uh, beginning on line 23 and, and going to line 24 reads, as secretary, the super, superintendent shall maintain accurate records, including a stenographic transcript of all board hearings. That's what staff proposed. It was based upon, I believe, a motion of the committee. This was not in staff's initial draft uh, that was brought before this committee. So then, in effect, the, the committee um, has already contemplated whether it wanted stenographic, a stenographic transcript of all board hearings generated. And now the question really becomes whether that should be clarified to, to be public. And uh, I think the next question then becomes whether there's an estimate as to what that cost might, what cost might be associated with that. And um, one can review the last year for how many hearings have occurred and the average length of those hearings. And then it's possible to then generate an estimate as to the price tag. Um, at least that's what it seems to me. And if members of the committee uh, who earlier had made a decision that they sought, a majority anyway, and majorities are important on the policy review committee, to the extent a majority had already made that determination that um, a stenographic transcript was needed, the question now becomes whether it should be um, public hearings limited, and if there's a concern about cost, what that cost should be. My memory is not great, mm -hmm. but I, I don't ever remember us voting on making a stenographic transcript of I don't, I don't know, know that we as a committee voted on number eight. Did well, I think I, I, I think I was necessarily here, but I don't recall exactly either. But the issue is, if in fact it's in, then the question is, does the committee still want to do it? And if the committee wants to do it, is it limited to just public? And if it's going to be public and the committee members have some concern about the costs, which seems like a legitimate question to ask, we could ask staff to go back and look for the cost of what public hearing transcription would run us if it was done stenographically. We don't have to vote tonight, although the act does take effect July 1st, but we can make a good faith effort to at least have the information before us and know. Yes, Kathleen. I was just going to say that in terms of cost efficiencies, $46,000 when we have our executive assistant that needs to access this information, when we have 12 board members that potentially need to access this information, when we have our staff from this committee, staffs from other committees that go back to the board meetings in terms of what our motions are, building in, uh, the, the building and contracts that are approved in the general board meeting, there's discussion around that time. And the superintendent would be going back and looking at what actually happened in the meetings. So when we're talking about that level of number of staff and number of board members, that it is much more efficient for one person who's a professional 
to do the transcript and then everyone else has it readily available to access? Well, uh, according to the minutes, uh, it appears that um, this was not the meeting that I was sick. And in fact, because it was such an excellent idea, I seconded it. Hmm. And uh, it was on the motion of Mr. Yulefelter that the policy be approved as edited, seconded by Mr. McDaniels. Um, Ms. Causey moved to amend the motion by to include a paragraph that reads, maintain accurate records, including a Senate graphic transcript of all board hearings. Seconded by Mr. Virch, the vote was three to two. Mr. Yulefelter and Mr. McDaniels voted against. And it, as it reads, the motion carries. So. Uh, as I said, <laughs> it appears that the committee voted the way it voted already, so then the question becomes, do we want to amend it to say, to limit it to public hearings? <laughs> and um, Ms. Causey, uh, your motion is to um, have it go to public, to insert the word public on line 24 between all and board. Uh, I've seconded it. Is there any further discussion on Ms. Causey's motion? I believe Ms. Causey, Ms. Causey also indicated as appropriate yes. at the end. All right. All right, so um, any further discussion on the motion? All in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed? Uh, the motion carries. All right, that's the first motion. Next motion. Is there a second? Is there a second? Well, I'll second it just because I want to find out what this term tied to means. Well, the, way that we, excuse, the way that we currently have the video tied to the agenda items the transcript could either put the link of the, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the stenographic transcript could either put the agenda item number somehow where it ties to the board doc agenda because the board doc agenda is very organized already, so. If you're talking about committees, ma'am, uh, that is not how your committee agendas are posted on the website. Yes, and that's actually one of the new modules that the board docs people talked about was a policy module. So that's something I need to talk with you about at uh, another meeting because it's not on the agenda. Any other um, comments with regard to this motion? Yes, David. Uh, are, we talking, are we talking about all committees? It's not my motion. Yeah, I mean, that's, all, all That's my motion. I mean, Kathleen, all yeah, you want to respond to David, please? Uh, does anybody have any reasonable idea of the cost when we go to all committees? Well, we have committees now that are not uh, videoed and they're hand minutes. So if now you're saying we have to get a professional st stenographer for all committee meetings, uh, I suggest that the cost is going to become prohibitive. Um, and if you add that to the first motion where we have a cost, and I'm not sure it's 46,000. 46 was predicated on something narrow. Yours is much more expanded. So I, I would suggest that we're gonna spend a lot of money um, and we need availability of stenographer. You know, we have small meetings too. We don't always have a large meeting like this. I'm just weary of the kind of costs we're, we're doing and I don't see any great benefit out of it. In some parts of our, our meeting, like at, in our audit committee meeting, there's a lot of sensitive things that uh, we go into closed session. And the, uh, the first part may be a 10 minute, and then the rest of it is, is uh, relative to uh, audits, individuals, and so forth, and um, they're excluded. So we're gonna pay the cost of a sonographer to come for a, a 10 minute. That's the same reason why our, the audit committee is not being videoed because the cost of putting it all together for a short period of time doesn't doesn't outweigh or does outweigh uh, the bit of public information that people are welcome to sit in on. So. Um, any other board member comments? I would suggest this to um, our members. 
it is possible for us to move the policy uh, with amendments, but on the issue of cost, to ask staff to go and uh, look at what these amendments are, if they're approved, and then secondly, what this particular one would be if to expand it to include all committee meetings, what that might run. Um, because I know that members of the committee have expressed their concern about being watchful regarding the expenditure of public funds um, and how precious those dollars really are for education. So my suggestion to the committee is uh, we can certainly vote on this motion. It's been moved and it's been seconded. Um, but at the same time, if were it not to be, and who knows until we vote, that we could ask that the cost, because it's a legitimate question, legitimate question that could be asked at the board meeting. So, um, and if we find out what the costs are, and folks wanted to amend at a board meeting, well then they could amend at a board meeting. So that's sort of what my suggestion is. If there's no more comments, uh, then I'll just call for the vote and we'll uh, move on. Any other comments? I guess the only thing, the comment I have is, are you saying that what we're, deciding on when we overall is to send it back to staff and then it's going to come out to the full board it's not going to come back to prc one more time because we're under a time constraint because of the implementation of the law two things we have to well first we'll have to follow the law regardless of how our policy reads and i think miss holly would agree we can't be violating the law and as she said when it come july 1st we're going to be trying to comply then the question becomes conforming our our policy to reflect these changes in the law what I'm suggesting is these changes that we're making, they have to go get, like, we have to clean up this policy for us to vote on anyway. That then means that well, there's some time there for staff to take a look, if the committee members so direct, to find out what would an updated cost be to include the cost of committee meetings. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Sure. So, uh, any other questions? Um, all in favor of the motion, uh, raise your hand. Any opposed? Motion fails. Next motion, Kathleen. So the last one that, uh, for this policy is on page one at uh, paragraph 8H. It will be added to line number 40. Compile and present information useful to the board in making decisions and in keeping informed on the progress and or as directed by the board chair. And my amendment would be to add or directed by a majority of board members. Is there a second to the motion? Second that. Okay, Kathleen? I think that it's uh, appropriate to have the ability for a majority of board members to um, also request specific information rather than have information limited by only one member of a 12-member board. Uh, any other comments? My sense is that eight in itself warrants additional attention uh, because as it reads, compile and present, uh, it reads in total, as executive officer, the superintendent shall compile and present information useful to the board in making decisions and in keeping informed. It seems to me that there's a sub subject that's missing in there uh, on the progress of BCPS and or as directed by the board chair. I think uh, or a majority of board members, I think that's board action and um, it doesn't, doesn't need to be in because the board's taking the action to vote it. I don't see a harm in it being included, but it's to suggest that somehow the board has limited itself in its majority action. Um, and I note that the motion reads majority, not super majority, and it doesn't read four member minority. So to the extent that this paragraph needs to be revised anyway, um, I think we should talk about what should go in there about who's, to, who's gonna be in keeping informed. Um, any other comments? Well, I would propose an amendment to what is proposed to read, compile and present information useful to the board in making decisions and in keeping 
the board informed on the progress of BCPS, comma, and or as directed by the board chair or as directed by a, maj by a majority vote of board members. But I would note there is this, thank you for seconding, because now by way of reasoning, informed on the progress of BCPS, that's not a particularly clear term. So that's my only reluctance. I mean, I like to think the system is progressing and we're doing good things, but uh, informed, um, perhaps the word would be in regard to or with regard to uh, BCPS, informed regarding uh, BCPS, perhaps that's the better term to use because if all we're going to talk about is progress, which I think is a positive forward, forward looking thing, we may be overlooking those things that are not progressive, those things that might be regressive, things that might not have been working well. Any, uh, any comments? Yes, Kathleen. I mean, I would think when leaving it and keeping informed on the progress of BCPS would also allow for discussion of the lack of progress. So being informed on the progress would also include if there were a lack of progress. Well, what if I was just to say, how about if I withdraw my motion and have it read, and in keeping um, the board informed regarding BCPS. That way it's any kind of information. There's no limit. Right, it shouldn't be any limit, just be all inclusive. Okay, so is there? I would second that so one. There's a, okay, I'll just ask uh, Ms. Clark if she has a sense for what the motion reads. The, the motion to amend the original motion. As I understand it, it would break down, <laughs> compile, compile and present information useful to the board in making decisions and in keeping the board informed regarding BCPS and or as directed by the board chair or as directed by a majority of board members. I thought you said yes, majority Chuck. vote. Um, my concern with removing the word progress is that I don't think, at least my intent, is not to hear that the PTA Council is meeting, there are things that are going on in BP BCPS. I don't think that is what I would like to this number to mean. I think it's more the what you said, the overall direct, the, uh, and as Kathleen said, whether we're getting better or worse or how, whatever word you want. I don't want to just hear about BCPS. I want to hear about the direction of the educational work that we're doing. So pro at least progress kind of hints at that. I think taking it out just and leaves it open to anything. What if it was to read, and we're just talking, and I, I know this is, sounds like the need to withdraw um, an amendment to an amendment to an amendment, and in keeping board members informed, comma. How's that? I don't like that. All right, well, what do you like, Chuck? <laughs> um, even like progress or lack of progress or something. I mean, I just, I, I would like to know more about the general direction of the system as opposed to interesting items about BCPS. And I don't know, again, what words to use, but that's where, where I'd like the item to state. Well, directing your attention to the beginning, it reads, compile and present information useful to the board in making decisions. Does that do it for you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not hung up. I, I just think removing the word progress just leaves it so wide open to what we're interested in. Hearing. Say, compile and present all information useful to the board in carrying out their duties as Board of Education, period. That's all inclusive of everything, mm. unless you think something. Right. I'm willing to withdraw my motion, and uh, I know that my motion was to amend, I think, Kathleen's motion, um, but I think it would then read, compile and present information useful to the board in making decisions 
or in fulfill it, or how did you word it, David, with regard to duties? At all information, not, I don't want to limit it. At all, useful to the board in making decisions, keeping informed uh, on, I forgot what I said, the administration of, a, of BCPS or something like that. I would note that we already have invested 40 minutes I'm, on this I'm, policy. I just made that comment. Do we need a motion or, or since the uh, staff is going to take this back and, and rework it anyway? Um, just well, the, the deal here is that, that the, the staff knows what the majority of the board wants in terms so of the reworking. We, we ask that they include language uh, that, that's all encompassing. What if it read, compile and present information useful to the board in making decisions regarding BCPS and or as directed by the board chair or by a majority of board members. Is that, is that lean and clean enough? Yeah, Kathleen. Just to Mr. McDaniel's point about progress. So we make decisions, but there's also times when we're informed about progress or lack of progress or the need for um, some additional programs where we aren't necessarily making decisions right at that point. So for instance, we had a presentation on school climate. We didn't make any decisions about that, but that was a board, a, a staff presented to the board in order for us to understand, are we making progress on our priority of having a positive school climate? So I would dovetail with Mr. McDaniels on needing something about informed on the progress. Well. Um, I hear you, like and I'm staff. thinking that why are we limiting, as David suggested, information that we um, are having access to? And um, if it read, compile and present information useful to the board in making decisions, uh, in making decisions, and or as directed by the board chair, and or as directed by the board, by a majority of, the, of board members, that doesn't limit what information can be requested, which I think is probably the better way to proceed. Um, so I'll withdraw my motion and I'll seek to amend yours with uh, this language. Compile and present information useful to the board in making, in making decisions, comma, and or as directed by the board chair and or as directed by a majority vote of board members, period. I'm okay with that. Is there a second? A second. That you're, you're only talking about the ability to make decisions. David, there's short term and long term. So information we receive today may benefit us later to make decisions. Information we receive today may benefit us to make decisions immediately. And it's sort of a continuum of information gathering. Okay. I, 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 that's okay. Okay. Uh, whatever. Anyway, uh, any other discussion? Patty, um, are you are you comfortable with what how that should read? Yes. All in favor, raise your hand. Passes. Kathleen, any other motions? No. Okay. And that'll go back to uh, staff, for staff to make those revisions to clean up 82-22, and then we'll uh, have, have a look-see at it and uh, invest another 40 minutes in fixing that. Uh, we're on to uh, three, uh, and I noted <clears throat> that the only comment that someone made at our board meeting um, uh, was that unless someone was online, they might not know what the agenda for board meetings are and that that uh, impairs communication to folks who'd want to take an interest and comment on um, policies. Um, and they weren't familiar with what the policies uh, that were on for first reader for the board um, until they came and received a packet of information as to what was identified. And that's what my recollection uh, was the only comment received. and. Um, that was um, from Ms. Uh, Saroff, 
um, on policy 1270. Uh, based on Ms. Saroff's uh, testimony, um, do any board members have any uh, motions that they'd like to make with regard to uh, the input from Ms. Saroff? Yes, Kathleen. I don't think this has to be a, tied to a policy, um, but it, there are communication paths that are used now that do not include the board meetings. So there's news tips, there's the calendars um, that are online and digital. So it might be a better practice of the board to have those, to have all communication paths that are going out to parents in terms of calendars where they say on Tuesday we have a uh, parent mobile coming to this school or we have a parent u university class in here or we have some student activity um, that they would as a matter of course include all of the board meetings that are happening so that it becomes a regular communication path it's um, and then it's something that parents can have because those news tips are very informative I find. With respect, the Ms. Sarles' comments were not that she didn't know there was a, a board meeting. Uh, her concern was that she didn't know the specific policies that were going to be looked at or introduced for first reader. Um, uh, I mean, I think we're all in favor of additional communication and um, listing uh, board meetings, committee meetings on, say, the hot tips um, for whatever interest it may draw. I mean, I don't see anything, anything bad about it, and I suspect it could be readily implemented um, without um, any specific action on the part of the board. Whether that then makes the email uh, that much longer to to get through <laughs> when you're when you're looking at what the hot tips are that might be uh, another uh, matter. Um, anyway, are there any motions with regard to Ms. Saroff's um, uh, public comments? In the absence of any, uh, I ask that we now move to the next policy, which is policy 3231, vendor performance evaluation. And I would ask Mr. Smith. Uh, to come forward along with Mr. Saris. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you. Members of the committee, I'm joined by Mr. Saris to discuss policy 3231, vendor performance and evaluation. I know this is a policy that the board has had quite a bit of interest in, so I won't belabor the fact. I will kick it directly to Mr. Saris to go through the salient points. So at at the uh, last meeting, uh, the committee requested that we provide uh, the rule, the draft rule, for their review, uh, which was done, and a uh, couple of uh, suggestions were made by the chair, uh, to which I have no objection, and uh, would be happy to answer any other questions that the members have. Um, thank you, um, uh, George. I did want to ask you, directing your attention to uh, the rule as proposed for amendment if the policy, revi proposed revised policy was adopted, uh, directing your attention to um, line 36 on page one, non-construction contracts. Um, as I read that, really the triggering mechanism for um, when a sponsoring office shall complete a vendor appraisal form is when they're requested by the Office of Purchasing. Um, is that correct? Assuming the contract. Correct. Mm -hmm. and so as it reads, by the Office of Purchasing for all contracts over $25,000. Um, so when a request would come from the Office of Purchasing, the request the request is... It's uh, not for all contracts over $25,000. Please generate, a uh, as a sponsoring office, a, a vendor appraisal report. It more likely would be, here's this contract for over $25,000. Uh, the Office of Purchasing is requesting the specific sponsoring office to generate a single vendor appraisal report for the following vendor. Correct. Right, and that's, the, yeah. yes. that, that's what my concern was with the proposed rule. It makes it sound like the request can only be for all. I mean, I know that doesn't make common sense, but the way it's worded, 
You're right. The intent was that for all contracts over 25000 the purchasing office will require the uh, sponsoring office to complete the evaluation. Okay, and I can't resist asking you this question because it, it just it just it begs to be asked. Under um, uh, three definitions B suspension, it says uh, an interim action taken by the purchasing manager to prevent vendors with unsatisfactory appraisal reports from bidding on additional BCPS contracts, comma, where there is probable cause for debarment. And I wanted to ask you what, what you meant, or strike that, what was meant by the probable cause standard? Is it more likely than not that's, that, that they should be disbarred? I mean, that's what I'm just trying to. Yeah, it's, it's really not intended to be a legal term in the context of criminal law, uh, but rather, and we could certainly come up with something less uh, suggestive of that, um, but when there has been questionable performance, uh, we would suspend a vendor from further bids and participation until we make a determination on debarment, which is also appealable uh, to both to to me from the purchasing manager and to the superintendent from me. Um, so I'd be happy to change the probable cause language. But would would perhaps some language? And uh, I don't, I'm just talking with you here, it's what I hear you saying is if there was something in the vendor's um, history of performance or lack thereof on a particular contract that might warrant debarment. Yes. That's really what you want to be your that's sort of what that, that's what you were, your sense would be under that under that part of the rule. Yes, and those are itemized in seven B on pages three and four, where we list thirteen uh, criteria for which uh, debarment would be appropriate in the rule. Excuse me. Yeah. So I mean, our the role of the policy review committee is not to write the rule. It's to make sure that the policy is a, is a policy that's reasonable and meets certain needs so that the more specific implementation of the policy can be delineated in writing. Yes. I got you. All right. Um, any board members have any questions with regard to um, the policy 3231 or um, what was provided at the request of the committee, a copy of the proposed revised rule 3231. Yes, Kathleen. Thank you. And I wanted to thank staff for working on this and I'm very glad to see this policy come forward. Um, in the past three years of my service on the board, multiple times I have requested vendor performance evaluations. And after three years of being on the Buildings and Contracts Committee, I have never received a vendor evaluation, a vendor performance evaluation. So I am looking forward to having this policy enable the board members to see those evaluations in a timely fashion. Um, so what I wanted to understand is, if you can walk us through the rule, because from my reading, it seems as if there has been a removal in the policy, excuse me, a removal in the rule of contracts, non-construction contracts, having to have one that's over $500,000. Is that because it's now, the price has now dropped to, for all contracts, over $25,000? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. However, you say in the rule that if a sponsoring office fails to complete a vendor appraisal report requested, the Office of Purchasing will consider the vendor performance to be satisfactory. I don't think that's appropriate. I think if it's requested to be done, it should be done. Just because it's not done doesn't mean it is satisfactory. 
Well, the, the intent here is to, because we are obviously increasing the volume of this work by revising this rule, that uh, obviously it's the burden on the, the managing office to comply, but if for some reason they haven't, uh, and because if there were a problem with a contract, there would be other uh, triggers pulled, such as uh, my office would draft a letter to cure, and uh, we would be meeting with the vendor, all of which would be more uh, important than filling out this survey in, this, in the case of noncompliance. Uh, that the focus would shift to those legal actions of enforcement away from filling out the form. I hear what you're saying, and I agree with the element of the additional amount of work for staff. <coughs> and I think perhaps what may be needed is a separate statement that there is a dollar value where it is required that that evaluation be done. And if it's not done, then that contract would be deemed unsatisfactory. I would be happy to consider that and discuss it Is that with the staff. And I'm curious my uh, colleagues' thoughts uh, on that. Oh, I agree with that sentiment. I think that we, if we're going to have a practice that we shouldn't assume because we, for lack of information that everything's okay. So I would rather raise the level that we're going to do, require it, and um, not assume anything uh, as a part of it. Um, okay. Also, I was just noting that this policy is connected to policy 6002, which also applies to contracts, I believe, and maybe we should uh, discuss them both at the same time. And uh, perhaps, in fact, it does deal with contracts. It deals with textbooks and the purchase of them. And uh, to the extent the form that would be, is proposed to be used and which is attached to the packet that uh, our committee members received, it seems the folks who'd be making most use on a regular basis would be our uh, Buildings and Contracts Committee members. So just as um, earlier minutes suggested that with policy 6002, uh, we should jointly uh, meet with the building and contracts folks, perhaps this would be another agenda item to add to that um, so that th the other members of the building and contracts committee would be able to have input about the form that's proposed and uh, whether there's something they see in this policy that they as a committee would like to have rather than have us in policy just making decisions for uh, what the folks in another committee might uh, have to follow. Makes sense. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, any other discussions uh, for now, at least, with regard to pol uh, policy 3231 and/or the rule? Kathleen. So, where are we headed in terms of this coming out to the full board, or sending it back to staff, or well, I think sending it, it sure. to building and contracts committee first? What What do you see as the process? What I see is that. Um, um, I would huddle with Nick and find out what sort of time uh, might be convenient. Um, I don't know if we can get uh, members of this committee uh, to um, a buildings and contracts committee meeting. And um, the three of us are on the committee. Exactly. So it, it could actually work well um, and uh, do both of these policies and then. Um, and I don't know how we would, I mean, I think we could probably work that through. And, um, and I talked with, with council about whether we could just have our discussion, ha suggest our amendments, uh, and have it voted on, and then have, uh, since Building and Contracts is on board, uh, then it comes to Policy Review Committee, who then gets the cleaned up draft because it it either reflects or doesn't reflect. If it reflects what was discussed, then it comes out of policy review and it goes to the board. And the board um, now has the benefit of having uh, both policy or both committees that uh, directly uh, impact on this 
uh, review it, and it has the specialized focus of the people on the other one. It seems complicated, but I don't think it would be that difficult to effectuate. I don't see why not. Makes some sense. Well, there's an endorsement if Makes I heard one. Makes some sense for a change. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, anyway, any other any other uh, discussion at this point? Yes, Kathleen. So, back to the policy 3231, mm -hmm. and uh, paragraph two standards, letter B. The board reserves the right to use a vendor performance evaluation process to appraise a vendor's ability to perform on subsequent contracts. I would like to make an amendment for that to say to perform on subsequent co contracts or to decide to continue or discontinue the contract. Um, if I might just point out, if the uh, it's it's down on line 25 on page one. Yes. If, if I might just point out, in, in the absence of a second at this point, to the extent that it's the uh, desire of the policy review committee uh, members that this be done jointly with buildings and contracts, we could just entertain a motion that we do the two of these together. I huddle with Nick, we get a date, we have our hearing, and then it isn't as though we've amended a policy without input from buildings and contracts folks. I mean, and you could, in fact, we could do it where we have our amendments and we circulate them to everybody in advance so everybody's aware of what's being proposed and then folks can decide what it is they want to do. So could I just in interject oh, that um, the board has the right to terminate a contract for convenience or for cause and I don't want it to limit itself by linking it to directly to the performance evaluation from a legal perspective to which I defer to our council. And I also hear how, how and I mean, I heard how it's written so that it's, it just identifies the process. It doesn't strictly limit what would be that criteria at this point so that right. there isn't um, opportunities for abuse of what's supposed to be an accountability process. Right, because the performance report might say that uh, the defend that the vendor delivered a great product, that it was competitively priced, but it arrived three days late. And, you know, on that point uh, within the report, you wouldn't necessarily want, unless that time were of the essence and it were critical, you wouldn't just want to take that single item out of the 15 rated criteria. All right, well at this point we have a motion. Is there a second to that motion? I haven't yet made mine about uh, doing a joint whatever, uh, but we have a motion to actually amend, and uh, is there a second? In the absence of a second, I'd make a motion. The motion would be that um, the policy review committee schedule a joint um, meeting with the um, Buildings and Contracts Committee to uh, discuss uh, the revision of policy 3231 and policy 6002. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Um, again, I'm in favor of this. I just um, wonder, do we get into any different realm if we have a quorum of the board when we combine the committees is that you're already a public the the committees are already being treated as public bodies so, it doesn't so. Make any, okay. all right thank what you what a nuanced comment chuck i i, I agree i hadn't thought I of just that woke up and said that i, I, I but i'll tell you why <laughs> <laughs> okay i'll take it all right kathleen so i wanted to discuss a scenario mm -hmm. it's not related to making an amendment but it is to have the concern understood and then f for uh, staff and my colleagues to consider how can this concern be addressed um, if in fact others share the concern. So back in 2014, there was a $205 million contract passed for laptops. And then just recently um, in May, there actually it was supposed to, the vote was supposed to be taken in March, but we had a snowstorm, so then it was in April. There was a contract for $140 million in laptops, mm -hmm. and it ended up going to the same 
vendor with the same manufacturer. And yet after spending, I believe it was 163 million out of that 205 million spending authority, the board did not have a vendor evaluation to look at to see how this contract had worked out across four years, $163 million and 80,000 students, 11,000 staff that were impacted by, by the product. So how is that concern of getting in a timely fashion information on our vendor performances going to be addressed in the policy and the rule? Well, it's addressed because we're talking about semi-annual evaluations rather than an evaluation at the end of the contract term. So, is, but is that a semi-annual evaluation that's not, that will be deemed satisfactory if not turned in? Or is, where is the dollar volume or where is the criteria well, that make sure that this situation doesn't happen again. Well, I'll just also add that we did verbally attest to the satisfactory uh, performance of the vendor you're discussing, but um, you're right, the language that we've currently talked about, which is under possible revision, would not require uh, that every office respond and that uh, that's something we'll we're taking back to staff to consider changing and that's something that we in this joint committee can discuss in terms of what dollar volume what number of students impacted what is the criteria that the board feels is appropriate to receive uh, a timely vendor evaluation in order to make the best decisions for our students. And and I would just point out that um, what Mr. Sarris is referencing with regard to uh, semi-annual evaluations, um, that's actually language that's used in the rule, at least proposed. Correct. In fact, there's a proposal to remove the semi-annual in its current location on lines 13 and lines 14 on page two. But the question that would be for the joint committee would be on whether it's warranted to be mentioned in the policy itself. And I don't see any reason why that discussion couldn't occur. And if folks wanted to take the position that there are some things that the board, um, as part of governance, should limit itself to, well then that's a position that board members can articulate if that's what they choose to. And I'm not certainly here to argue the merits of either side, but I don't see any reason why uh, that, that would not be something that, that we would discuss, because we do try to find that balance between governance and administration that the General Assembly has written in statute. So in the absence of a second, then I would make my, uh, I would just uh, make my motion, and I think I already spelled it out, um, Patty, and I think it was, um, or Ms. Clark, and I think it was seconded, was it? It was, David. Okay, any other comments? Sure, Kathleen. There's one other scenario I wanted to run by staff. Um, in February of 2016, there was a $41 million projector contract for um, 6,000 instructional uh, classrooms or locations in the school system to receive a new type of projector system. Um, and the board uh, rejected the contract and instead asked the staff to bring back a policy for one year and also to have a variety of options on it. Point of order, I think what you meant to say is a proposed contract for one year as opposed to a policy for one year. Yes, thank okay, you. Okay, very good. I'm in policy review. Um, so a, for, for a one year contract. The system did not do that but instead purchased the same product under a consortium and up to a value of, I believe it was over $500,000, for which I had requested a vendor evaluation and which was never received. And it turns out that that product did not work as desired, and so staff went back and selected a different projector system. So how would this policy and rule need to be designed in order to make sure that 
when these large purchases are being made, even if they're being made onesie twosie, that there is a proper evaluation done. It appears that this contract that you're mentioning is, a, is, is greater than $25,000, which would be part of this process here. So it would fall under that criteria moving forward. I was informed that it, since they were being purchased onesie twosie at $6,000 or $12,000 on a purchase order, that they were, that it did not fall under the criteria to receive a vendor evaluation. So my concern is that we should have something in policy and rule that prevents that scenario from happening, from the board rejecting a product and yet the system purchasing it in a fashion where it bypasses the vendor evaluation process. And I'm not suggesting that you have that answer now, but that is a scenario that I would like to see reflected Mr. in this. Mr. Chair. Sure. I would ask the staff if they're prepared to clarify some of the comments Ms. Causey made to make sure that they are accurate. I don't know if she intended, but it sounded like you were suggesting that the staff tried to go around what the board wanted to do when they um, sent the contract back and instead purchased items uh, at a lower rate so they could get around the will of the board. And I don't think that's what happened. I think the, the staff actually purchased uh, those uh, tools on an existing contract. George, any clarification? That's correct. I'm, I'm not aware of a situation in which a product that was determined to be unsatisfactory was purchased so that I don't have those facts. It wasn't deemed to be satisfactory until after it was purchased and installed in three schools. And it was deemed unsatisfactory? Well, it was not purchased anymore for any additional schools. Instead, we switched to a different projector system. So. I would need more information to see if that's relevant to the discussion of vendor performance rather than other contractual or procurement issues? Well, it definitely relates to vendor performance because if there are if there are five hundred thousand dollars worth of the similar product purchased and there's no vendor evaluation done to determine whether it's meeting the needs of our students, whether it's cost effective, whether it's meeting the programs that need to be met, then those purchases could continue to be made without any evaluation, without any process to prevent that. I would just point out two things. The first is vendor performance and cost effectiveness can in fact be two separate and distinct things. Under one contract, in a snapshot in time, what is cost effective in terms of competitiveness in the marketplace is what it is at that time. Competitiveness in the marketplace and financial opportunity to obtain a quality product at a reduced cost may in fact be a function of competitiveness in the marketplace that has changed. So we can't assume that vendor performance is in fact indicative of cost effectiveness across the board because times change and the cost of products do as well. The motion hand is whether there should be a joint meeting and uh, Ms. Clark uh, has, uh, um, has the language for what uh, the motion was and it's been seconded. Is there any further discussion on the merits of a joint meeting at this time? In the absence of any further discussion, all in favor of joint meeting as proposed with the Building and Contracts Committee on two policies, 6002 and policy 3231. If you're in favor, please raise your hand. Very good. Passes and staff, I would ask that you um, please uh, uh, talk with your counterparts on that other committee. I certainly will follow with Mr. Stewart and we will get this joint committee meeting uh, arranged at a time convenient to the membership. With that regard, we now move to policy 7310, uh, determination of school design and construction costs renamed as design and construction costs. 
Mr. Smith. <coughs> Committee members, I am joined by Mr. Pete Dixit to um, bring to you policy 7310, the renaming of, um, of a policy for, uh, named as design and construction construction um, in accordance with board policy and superintendent's rule. Um, this contract is coming forward to you with the, with the various um, changes and I'll turn it over to Mr. Dixit who will go over those changes for you. Good evening board members. Welcome, Mr. Dixit. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, policy 7310 establishes procedures for determining school design and construction costs. We are recommending the policy be revised to rename it include a standard section which requires a guideline be established for the development of a system for estimating the cost and conform to board's policy editing conventions. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Briefly stated, if you had to describe mm -hmm. how costs are currently estimated, how would you do that if you had to do it briefly? The costs are estimated at different times and they are updated as we know more information about the project. The first cost estimation is done at the time of budget preparation. At that time, a lot of details are not available, but past uh, cost history of similar projects is available, and there is standard methodology used for different types of projects, uh, textbooks available for that. So staff uses the best judgment and the practices that we have used in the past, <coughs> along with some of the unit cost factors that a state provides for construction costs. Based on all of that experience, uh, all of the information and their professional experience, they come up with the best cost. But as the project moves to design development, uh, more and more details of the projects are available. So the cost is fine-tuned and shared with uh, the staff and with the fiscal partners. So the revised policy that's before us right now, if it was to pass magically by this policy review committee and actually became the policy, notwithstanding it has to go through the board, as it clearly should, yeah. but if in fact it was to pass magically right now yeah. and Tomorrow, on Tuesday, you had to um, uh, estimate costs for a construction project. You would not create a different system. This is merely an effort to this provide the language hard. as to how you go forward with a construct for estimating construction costs. That's right. So it isn't like there's some new way to do it mm -hmm. that we're not currently utilizing, and the language that exists is permits by rule for. Um, additional refinement for uh, better estimating costs within uh, the sort of the odd way between the state of Maryland, the, the county, Baltimore County government, and ourselves yeah. to proceed with, the with, with determining construction needs and, and satisfying them. You are absolutely right. We are affirming the existing process and fine tuning it, adding more information, and memorializing it in role. And in fact, conforming to the editing conventions that provide for a standard section as we do in our policies. That's true. Correct. Correct. All right, any questions with regard to this policy? I just have. Yes, David. I, I would like to, um, on line 10, I believe that it would be important to provide this word. It presently says to provide optimum learning environments. I would suggest after learning, we also have safety environments learning and safety, or the equivalent word for safety. Mm -hmm. Is that a motion, David? Yes. Okay. Um, I would certainly second it. And David, I would ask you this question. Um, if, because you sort of left it open-ended uh, to incorporate the concept of safety, if it were to read to provide optimum learning to provide safe and optimum learning environments. I'm fine. I just think that, that, that in addition to um, 
learning, which is, is really the education, that we just make sure we, we do things now in the future that uh, at the, whatever the best practices are for safety, since it's a hot topic, but I think we have an obligation to make sure that that's part of what, what we are, in fact, doing. We recognize the importance of safety as well as learning. All right. So you, you, would you accept an amendment? You, I'll, I'll let you do the wording. You understand what I'm trying to say. Um, I would propose an amendment to David's uh, proposed amendment, which would uh, read for the policy statement beginning with line seven, the Board of Education of Baltimore County, paren, board, paren, recognizes its responsibilities to build educational facilities and any additions thereto, and to renovate any such facilities, comma, when necessary, to provide safe and optimum learning environments for all Baltimore County public schools, paren, BCPS, paren, students, in a cost-effective manner. <laughs> Any further discussion on the amendment? I think it's great. Only great. Um, Fantastic. <laughs> Any further discussion? Uh, all, in favor, all in favor, raise your hand. Any further amendments? Uh, that'll be recommended. Yes, Kathleen. I just had a general question. Sure. Um, there was a legislation passed this session related to transferring um, school construction authority, additional authority to the interagency committee for school mm -hmm. construction. So there were some new regulations that I believe were approved by the IAC at their first meeting. Um, how does that impact this or does not impact this or how does it impact the work of your department? To the best of my knowledge, all of those changes um, pertaining to HB 1748, I believe, they will be effective uh, FY 2021. So they are still in the formative stage. We are working with IAC, and uh, we are uh, in open communication with them. And if there are significant changes, we'll share with the leadership here. Okay, thank you for that update. All right, uh, thank you so much. Moving to the next item on our agenda, which is um, superintendent's report, policies for review in 2018 to 2019. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? So you're gonna adjourn yourself, okay. All righty, all right, David. Be safe. All right, um, with, so with regard to superintendent's report, Yes, very briefly, um, with respect to the next three items, members of the committee, uh, policy scheduled for review in 2018-2019, uh, pursuant to Board of Ed Superintendent's Rule, excuse me, 8130, um, the policies that are scheduled for review with the five-year cycle, as well as those for annual review, uh, have to be presented to the board uh, prior to the end of July of each year. Uh, so the staff proposes uh, recommending what is currently behind tab six uh, to be on the July 6, 2018 board agenda. Well, when you say board agenda, do you mean the policy review committee agenda? No, it would be the board agenda oh, see, as an information it, item, sir. Sure, okay. And because of the superintendent's report, does it warrant any action by the policy review committee? Uh, Very good. Simply for your information. For your information as well, behind tab seven, you have the policy editing conventions. Uh, these are the um, standard that the staff uses so that all policies that are presented to the board are in the same format. So it's a bureaucrat's dream. And then behind tab eight, what you have is the Board of Education's Appeals Handbook. Um, several years back, the policy, this is actually the birth, uh, the, the brainchild of the Policy Review Committee. Uh, there were several questions from appellants, particularly pro se appellants, as you can imagine, uh, having to parse through the board policy on hearings. Uh, so uh, at the direction of the Policy Review Committee, um, something that was in um, uh, 
more colloquial format was published, and this is the outcome. It is the Policy Review Committee's document, and it is presented as well, again, each year to the board for information. And then finally, what you have behind tab nine, oh, and I'm sorry that your, um, your uh, hearing examiners did not have any recommended changes. They do recommend changes from time to time based upon questions that are received from parents. And then finally, behind tab nine, um, although this is speculative, uh, the uh, committee is, or the committee staff is proposing these dates uh, for committee meetings for the 18-19 school year. And that is the end of the superintendent's report. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Yes, Kathleen. I had questions for Ms. Howie. Sure. Thank you. Under tab six, superintendent's report policies review, I don't see the discipline policies that were pulled back last year and then were supposed to be brought back this year but have not been brought back? So my recollection is that the, uh, the board withdrew those policies uh, based on its desire to have hearings uh, for um, student discipline issues and there is not yet direction from the board as to when you wish uh, or when the board wishes these placed again on the board agenda. Superintendent uh, did not place 5550 on uh, the this particular list because it is usually done as an annual review but was not done that last year. So it is, if this is the uh, committee's pleasure, And where it was left last time, in fact, was uh, was left with the board, and it was then uh, through the board's action. And we'd had this discussion at a prior policy review committee meeting, and um, uh, it was shared uh, correctly that, in fact, it was a board matter. Yes, Kathleen. So as a policy review committee, I would recommend, <clears throat> I would make a motion that we have the policy brought forward for the September meeting brought forward by the superintendent and staff. They've had two task force working on it, so I think it would be appropriate to bring it and not leave it unattended over 18 months with, with no time frame to review it. Well, um, is there a second to the motion? A second to that. Okay, um, to the extent <laughs> that um, there is also going to be a task force on um, bullying, there now will be three entities that are at work. I think um, what would be most useful would be for an update to um, the board, if that's the board's wish. I know it's my wish as on this committee that there be an update as to the status of those two entities. Uh, Mr. Dickerson is here and he can share an update at this point uh, with us. I would only say that I would ask that the committee let me go back to the superintendent and staff to see when would be the appropriate time that we'd be ready to present any information to the board. Uh, as Ms. Causey said, there are a couple of uh, committees or task force working, and so I would ask for that, uh, that uh, leeway to, to go back and bring back information. Mr. Dickerson, if I might ask you, um, one just doesn't snap one's finger and generate anything. Um, you indicate that folks are working. What does that mean? Well, really just it means that uh, there is there are uh, staff and committees working and looking at uh, discipline in schools um, and behavior in schools. And I just don't have an, uh, any updated information to provide right now on where they are in terms of being ready to present something publicly uh, to this committee or the board. I just would ask that um, we'd be allowed to go back and, and get that information. If I might ask you, there's at least two committees, is that right? There is at least two committees, and uh, as you indicated, there's uh, potentially a third committee uh, state-based. Task Force. Now, with regard to the first committee, um, do you, I mean, you don't call it like Committee A and Committee B. How do you refer to the first committee? I'd have to defer to Dr. McComas. Good evening, afternoon. 
Um, yes, yeah, so I can share with you um, what our two committees are um, at this point. Uh, one is a uh, work group uh, working with our TABCO um, partners um, in looking at what are discipline practices in schools as implemented and also looking at what our policies and procedures and our student handbook is. Uh, another committee um, is a group that uh, assembles annually to review the handbook um, and make any revisions um, that need to be done to that handbook. Um, and so that's the two work groups. Um, Dr. McCombs, thank you for uh, sharing that. I would like to ask you with regard to the first work group, you had mentioned membership on that includes folks from TAPCO. How big is this work group? Approximately, is it a five people? I would say people? approximately 25 people. 25 folks. And if you could just briefly describe the membership on that work group. It is comprised primarily of uh, TAPCO membership, um, myself, um, my uh, executive director, Dr. Wistead, uh, Dr. Adams joins us, as well as um, the community superintendents. And at what frequency does that, um, does this work group meet? Is it every um, six months? Is it every uh, two months? Is it every month? On average, I would say about every six weeks. There have been instances where it's been uh, four weeks and then because of either holidays or um, different scheduling challenges, it, it may have been some six week stretches in there. And when the work group was established, did the work group have its own timeline or come up with a, with a, a tentative schedule for its work product? So the, the group set forward um, aspects to look at and we have been working um, kind of month by month uh, through that process. And um, perhaps one of the more difficult questions is because aspects could be any number and each aspect could be a varying size. Correct. Um, looking at it as a whole, if you had to estimate, would you say that the work group, if you're able to, and it may be an unfair question, the work group is halfway completed its work. The work group is 75% complete of its work. Well, again, I think it, it is difficult to quantify in that manner. Uh, what I would say is we have identified some areas that we feel um, we, we've come to look at where our next steps of implementation are, and we have other areas that um, are still being analyzed. Right now, next steps in terms of implementation, you can see how next steps of implementation to board members is that term has a little different view because then it would be, imp it would be the implementation end would be actually approving a policy. So um, if I might ask you, um, to the extent that there has now been an Office of Climate established, and is that, uh, does, that, does the Office of Climate have representation on the first work group with TAPCO? Uh, so yes, through uh, Dr. Wistead. Very good. And with regard to the second work group, um, is there also representation of the Office of Climate on that second work group? Give I, me see, a second I see someone too. nodding in the background. <laughs> I personally have not participated in the second work group, which Dr. is Dr. if you'd like to come to the, to the, the witness table here. <laughs> so by the second work group, you mean the one working on the handbook that revises the handbook annually? Correct. Yes, so that is um, a large group that has uh, staff from the Office of School Climate as well as school administrators and teachers. And out of the first work group, we have included members from that TABCO work group to join the handbook work group. Also out of the initial work group, there are two other um, groups of people that are working on internal documents, manuals, that uh, one is the discipline manual and the other is the positive behavior planning guide. So we have also taken staff from the TAPCO work group and told them how we were working on these documents that um, hadn't been revised in several years. And the staff within the Office of School Climate it worked this year to begin revising those two manuals. So there's multiple work groups happening. So in fact, there's actually two proposed documents, at least two proposed documents that are underway. One is a, is a proposed discipline manual. 
Right, so that would be a guidance for schools like STEPS. Um, initially, many years ago, it was STEPS on how you would bring, um, like procedures on how to bring a student through to a board suspension and what documents are needed in that procedure. But we have kind of backed it up and started with, you know, when a behavior incident happens within your school, steps to follow, and then that's still like in flux all the way through the whole discipline kind of process. Um, what it states in the TABCO master agreement is that every school should have some kind of discipline policy. Um, they should have some kind of behavior management policy within each building, and so there was some miscommunication between the members of that initial TABCO group and what was happening in schools because they were calling it different things. They weren't calling it a discipline policy because the policy we follow is the board policy. But then within every school, they handle um, the procedures of an incident differently, and so that's determined at the school level. Right, and what I wanted to ask you is, these two documents is the contemplation for these two documents that they would be system wide. They'd be for use system wide. Yes, they're guidance documents. Correct. And when you re and approved documents. Right. Correct. Right. And when you refer to use in individual schools, mm -hmm. you're referring, are you referring to the discretion that's provided to say principals to administrators within our hundred and almost seventy five facilities? Yes. I see. And it would be under a common rubric, which would be these two proposed documents, mm -hmm. which when in fact there, when in the future there is a, a board policy, these proposed documents would need to align, in fact flow from mm -hmm. any overall mm -hmm. system-wide board approved, which is somewhat redundant obviously, um, um, policy. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Yeah, so the current handbook that um, went through some revisions this year still had to use the previous board policy with all the categories and all of that language. Now, with regard to a timeline for um, the two work groups, I um, asked Dr. McComas about what that timeline was because I don't want to presume that um, one can just point a finger and set a date, and what then is produced is a final work product. Based on your uh, participation in these two work groups, mm -hmm. um, what can you share with the Policy Review Committee today as to, if not a percent, or where in the um, review that's underway are the two work groups? Well, um, I guess it's, it's hard to say because they're, they're still misunderstanding, so there's kind of different um, beliefs by different groups of people. So I think it's really powerful that we took some staff from the TABCO work group and allowed them to participate. Although we had teachers and administrators on those other committees, they weren't teachers that were part of this TABCO work group. And so they have different feelings than um, some of the other teachers that we had in the work group. Well, so they're, they're yeah, still sure. trying to come to a consensus consensus on um, what things should be uh, disciplined and not disciplined or allowed in schools or not allowed in schools. I mean, to give you an example, uh, the, the cell phone issue has come up and that is a sticking point that w not everyone's on the same page about. And if I may ask you, these two work groups, what if any participation on the two work groups is there for uh, parents of our students, I I believe I believe the handbook right has it. There are PTA mm -hmm. representatives on the student handbook mm -hmm. and have been mm -hmm. since time immemorial. Because that's been our practice. Mm -hmm. I got it. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Oh uh, yeah, Chuck. Mm -hmm. um, um, thank you. I um, just wanted to agree with Miss Causey that based on the input from stakeholders all around the county that it shouldn't be perceived or reality that we have our discipline policy on the back burner. 
um, and it's kind of delayed from when we looked at it the first time. But at the same time, I agree uh, with, I think, where you're going with this. There are a lot of activities that are going to affect wherever we go with the discipline policy. I think even Ms. Hen prepared us for a motion that she's going to make to start a task force of some sort. And um, how we coordinate all these different efforts with developing a policy is going to be challenging and timely. But, um, and I haven't thought this through, but it may be a big enough issue where this policy review committee could dedicate a certain portion, maybe it's 15 minutes every meeting, where we're looking, where we start, uh, ch you know, looking at this in, in um, some small portion, because I don't, I, I mean, it's going to be very intimidating to try to just revise our discipline policy all at once, but for us not to be looking at it regularly doesn't seem appropriate either. So, you know, rather than take, I don't know, it might, it's going to take us a long time, but maybe each meeting we could talk about it for 15 minutes just to coordinate what we're hearing and just to show um, the system that we, as a policy board, really appreciate the need to have a current discipline policy. But that's just my thought. Thank you. And I would um, agree with Mr. McDaniels about having updates and some point of discussion at each policy review committee meeting on this very important work that you're doing. And I'm encouraged to hear about the encompassing way that you're doing the work. Um, I did have a specific question which related to the uh, annual review of the handbook committee, because isn't that a time defined process? Yes, because we have to have a new one every year. Yes, so print. what is the timeline of that process? So it starts uh, at the start of the school year. They hold meetings regularly to look at what is in the current handbook and revisions that to be made uh, because this school year there wasn't a change in the discipline policy. All of those items remain the same. Um, some other general changes that they made is the formatting of it. They had um, intervention information later in the handbook. They moved it to the front of the handbook, thinking as you read through it, you would be looking at interventions first, then you'd be looking at um, what you would use as a reactive measure. So we kind of had the proactive things first, so we changed that around um, some of the content um, reflected more restorative language um, in it. And so those were the, the main changes that the group fleshed out and worked through this year, and then it's got to get ready to go to print um, so that it could be in the hands of children at the start of the school year. So this is not a board approved document? No, this the is, policy is. Right. The policy part. But the actual handbook that gets printed no, and handed out. It's not usually, I mean, in my experience, the, the handbook itself is not brought to the board for approval. But the, the specific contents that are already approved by the board, for example, the policy, that is approved by the board. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so it, that's already done for the coming year then? Yes. Okay. I would like for the board, the full board, to receive a copy of that as soon as possible, just for us to see what's in the handbook. Um, but also, I definitely agree that we need to um, we need to start working on this. Whether this, the system and with these different groups, everyone's getting a handle on it, that would be great. But we are hearing constant and consistent concerns from our stakeholders ab about discipline and violence and bullying that's happening in our schools. And while there's a, uh, the legislature has passed a uh, task force that they're gonna do, I don't think that this board can wait for that or rely on that. We have work that we need to do to keep our children safe, to keep our teachers safe, and to provide an orderly learning environment. So I'd like to discuss how we as a committee or recommending to the full board can understand where we are with this work because it sounds like you're doing a lot and maybe that's what's needed is to inform the board and the wider community of what is being done. Thank you so much. Uh, with that said, um, I would ask that we now uh, turn to uh, item nine uh, on our agenda, uh, which is the uh, last agenda item. Uh, the proposed policy review committee meetings for 2018-2019. 
for 2018 and 2019. Do we already have a meeting scheduled for August? You do not, ma'am. Should we? The normal practice has been that people aren't available in August. So it is at the committee's pleasure, obviously. Um, just with Janet, can you, is that uh, customary not to have a meeting in January also? It is not. Uh, however, given the fact that there will be transition on the board, the fact that the board has scheduled additional meetings to discuss the budget, um, it was, it is staff's recommendation that you not have a committee meeting in January since the board will already be overloaded with board meetings as well as budget meetings. And isn't it also true that any new board could decide to have as many meetings. Any board could decide to have as many meetings as they wanted to. That is uh, certainly true. <laughs> Very good. All righty. Yes. I understand uh, the staff's reasoning about January being crowded, um, but thinking forward in terms of the new board, that perhaps to have a policy review committee meeting that is an orientation not to actually process policy but to go through what is the normal process how these meetings flow how then the decisions flow back to the board for the process that we have there so I would just ask that that be considered any further comments that's a good idea I think <laughs> Josie any comments at your very last policy review committee meeting ever well, I can't speak for Halima. I don't know what she's doing. <laughs> All righty. Um, that is the last item on, um, on our listed agenda other than um, absenteeism. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it was on there because of some recent questions raised. And um, there is the business end of uh, project uh, attend and how we address issues of students not attending because if you're not in school uh, there's a lot that uh, of opportunities then that are missed and if you would identify yourself please I'm Sharon Oaks I'm the coordinator for people personnel services good and what would you like to share with us with regard to absenteeism well, I, if, I, if I may, Mr. Sure, Rich, we please. also have our uh, coordinator for school climate, uh, Dr. Brinkley, uh, I think will be here in just a moment. <laughs> she stepped out uh, for just a moment. Um, and uh, Dr. Wistead, so if I may, I'd like to have Dr. Wistead go ahead and share with us sort of our uh, approach here for updating you on absenteeism. Dr. Brinkley? Mm -hmm. Sure, Office so. Climate. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Brinkley. Please pull up a chair. <laughs> So um, we can share some general practices. We didn't know if you had specific questions or not, but certainly um, Sharon can go over for us the proactive measures and things we request schools do to kind of get ahead of attendance issues and then what to do once there are specific attendance issues for children and, and that whole process of what the recommendations are. So. Okay. So um, do you want to? Do you want to share that? Okay. Sure. So we have a sort of a flow chart that we use in the Office of People Personnel Services, and actually it starts with um, summer meetings with the PPW and their schools to establish practices for the upcoming year and to make a plan for their attendance committees. We recommend that all schools and most schools do actually have attendance committees that meet either quarterly, monthly, or you know however they believe suit the needs of the schools. So they start out with that summer our planning meeting, um, the committees typically consist of a number of school staff from an administrator, counselors, um, clerical staff who record the attendance, the nurse, and um, you know anybody else that may have specific information on why a student might be missing school. So through those um, attendance committee meetings, we identify kids that are sort of more high risk for not being successful in school because of attendance. And we start out with a series of interventions that are school-based, um, starting with attendance letters and um, 
you know, uh, require parent conferences, just meetings with students. And once the school feels like they've exhausted all of their efforts, then they'll um, ask for an intervention from the PPW, which could involve letters, home visits, um, you know, require, require parent conferences with a family. And if all of our interventions are not successful, then we have a program called Project Attend, which is sort of a more informal program that's a joint collaborative effort between the Department of Juvenile Services and our office and the schools where we bring selected kids um, in front of a hearing officer who is usually a DJS probation officer who just serves as a hearing officer. I just interrupt you really, could you say what DJS is? Oh, I'm is sorry, Department of Juvenile Services. Thank you sorry. so much. Sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> You're on a good roll there. Keep going. I know, I was. <laughs> um, so if at that um, meeting, we go over attendance grades, and we have a family and a student there, the PPW, and a member of the school staff. And we just look at, like, what are some of the things that we can do to assist that student? What are the barriers? What's keeping the student from um, attending school? And if it is determined to be an effective potential intervention, we'll place them on Project Attend. And their school kids just get a little bit more attention. For example, if by 10 o'clock that student's not in school before Connect Ed calls are going home, that student will get a personal phone call from somebody at the school to see where he or she is. Um, sometimes we give them alarm clocks or whatever they need to help them be successful. If after that things still are not improving, we'll involve the state's attorney and they'll send a letter reminding them of the attendance law and our final step will be to take them to district court. And when you say send them a letter, you're referring to the parents? Yes. I got you. And I, so there are a bunch of other things that we do outside of like the things that are on this little flow chart here. Um, we also do all kinds of proactive things. We do an attendance um, awareness month in November to coincide with um, um, American Education Week because we have parents in and out of the building. We sponsor little competitions between schools and try to do, you know, some things to get kids psyched about coming to school. We and also send out letters in the beginning of the year. We provide schools with items that they can put in their um, weekly or monthly newsletters that they send out about the importance of attendance. We have all kinds of letters that we've developed at schools and other offices could use to work on attendance. And then individual schools through that attendance committee will develop um, kind of like a positive behavior type of program. So for students that have good attendance, you know, each school determines how they're going to recognize specific students. Sometimes it's the letter from the principal at the end of every quarter. Sometimes it's a special treat of some kind at the school, a pencil or some sort of certificate of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think what's important that we've been requesting schools to do also through their attendance committees is kind of get to the root cause um, of what that behavior is. So why are they not attending and, and trying to work through that because the intervention will be different based on what the cause or the function of that behavior of why they're not coming to school is. And I'll add finally, uh, based on those data points, schools can then use that as their SPP climate goal in order to target attendance for the entire group or specific population of students. I understand my, my seatmate has a question. <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to ask Ms. Oaks or any of the panel um, if you could categorize or prioritize our, our big challenges in terms of chronic absenteeism. Is it the students that are beginning to lose interest in going to school? Is it health issues or their social? I know there are a bunch of them, but what, what are the, I guess, the big three? So health issues are often taken care of because if it's a chronic health issue, they can um, hold a student support team meeting and discuss uh, intermittent home and hospital so that education continues with it. So. And I would just say all of the above because, <laughs> um, you know, it's different with different students and we do a lot to try to determine like what are the barriers for individual students. Um, the PPWs um, make a lot of home visits to talk to parents about attendance and we can really sort of sort out is it a student who has like a school anxiety and then we can hook them up with hopefully one of the community mental health 
partners that are in most schools, or if it's a, a child that's just um, like a little oppositional defiant to try to give the parent some tips on how to get that student to school. Um, we do know that the earlier we intervene, the better success we have. So we really do try to um, spend a lot of time targeting elementary school kids to build, you know, really positive habits. And we're working really closely now, like with a lot of the preschool kids because we're finding that if they're not coming to preschool, then they're not doing so well in kindergarten, and it just sort of follows through. And it's important at that early age to communicate to the parents because the, our pre-K programs are not mandatory, but it, it's an opportunity to educate parents on the importance of coming to school every day. And as, but as some, somebody that's disconnected with that, I just still want to get, is school anxiety a big, I mean, what are the big things that you, encounter I mean or is it just so what such a wide variety you can't really well it is such a wide variety but sometimes it's parents don't are not organized and they just can't quite get themselves together sometimes it's kids that don't want to go and parents don't want to fight them so they let them stay home it's just it's a variety of things it's a kid whose parent maybe doesn't understand that if they have like a low grade fever that they don't need to come them home stay keep them home so a lot of times it's a lot of educating parents on you know what are some strategies that you can use how about if you just have all your kids stuff lined up the night before so in the morning you don't feel so unorganized or you know we have a flyer that we give to parents it's called um, when to send that we did in um, collaboration with our school nurses on like when should you keep your child home and when should you send them we try to encourage parents if your child is only feeling a little bit bad send them to school the nurse will tell you whether or not they should be home and then you're not charged with an absence if you send them to school and the nurse sends them home so we try to you know give parents some strategies that they can use that you know teach their kids better habits and parents as well. I, I think one additional piece to that in talking with school-based administrators because age three and four are not under compulsory attendance, some of them are a little confused about the steps that they can actually take when students aren't required to be in school. So part of it too is education for administrators around the proactive steps and who to work with within our department and even within the schools in order to have those monthly and or quarterly meetings with parents about the importance of early learning as it impacts as students continue on. And I also just wanted to comment, we've seen some things in the news recently about high numbers of, absent, of absenteeism. Mm -hmm. As that is reported, one of the things that came to my mind was um, home and health, where um, students do have a health situation, but it is being handled mm -hmm. through excused absences, through setting up other supports for that student. So in terms of absenteeism, there is a differentiation between the number of absences and the number of excused absences in terms of how our students are motivated to come to school and, and how they are receiving their education. Because if it's an excused absence, then they can make up the work and, and things of that, that nature. I mean, I just wanted to have you speak to kind of the sensationalism versus what is the reality for the school system and us working to educate our children. So um, I will speak to the concept of chronic absenteeism that refers to both excused and unexcused. So a portion of that is making sure that school and school processes include um, making sure that they get the notices from parents. Unfortunately, it doesn't, it, it doesn't take away the absence, but at least it allows us to justify why a student isn't there and have the proper procedures for students who are you know, ill or have uh, occasional illnesses that's going to require them to be out. So it's important that we emphasize having that because it is going to count against, but at least it will, we will be able to give solid numbers on those students who are out of school for valid reasons versus those who are not. And then the research shows not being in school is a deficit, you know, through the years as far as student achievement. So even it, being an excused absence and getting the makeup work, it's not closing that gap for students that are out. And what, what are the numbers where you define as chronic? Greater than 10? 10%. Greater than 10% of the number of days? Yes. Okay. And so keep in mind, if a student misses the first two weeks of school, 
they are going to be on that chronic absenteeism list until we get to the 100th day of school because they will already have missed 10 days. So it, it's predicated on the number of days that you're currently in session. So if you think in the first week, you can only miss, you know, a portion of that five days in order to not be considered. Well, every day really is important. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from board members? Uh, is there a motion? Thank you so much for your presentation and your patience during these questions. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Uh, any discussion? Yes, Kathleen. Excuse me, I was just going back to item number eight, which is our questions and answers on appeals and hearings before the Board of Education of Baltimore County. Is that going to be available on the website? Yeah. The answer is yes. Yes, it's um, where posted along with the policy with 8349. Okay, great. Thanks so much. All in favor of adjournment, raise your hand. Any opposed? Meeting is now adjourned. Thank you ever so much.